all. Good to see you all. Please be seated. God is good. Uh, is this for me or somebody else? I don't want to be... No, no, it didn't come from me. Oh, yeah. Um, so if someone is trying to sneak in a message, that's not working. Oh, yeah. God is good. All righty. So first of all, I'm excited to be here. As you know, um, we get to experience the presence of God here in such a tremendous way. One of the things that struck me while we were praying as my wife was leading us in prayer was um, the fact that we get heard when we come here. I know God hears us all the time because the Bible says that his ears are inclined to our prayers. Now, God is too busy listening to us to listen to the wicked. Okay, because the Bible says that the Lord does not pay attention to the prayer of the wicked. And so when you know that, then you should be confident that he hears you always. Jesus said concerning his relationship with your father, with his father and yours, um, he said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. And Jesus says, as I am, so are you. So if truly we have become heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus, then that is a privilege that is part of our inheritance. Remember, as my wife was praying earlier, she did say that not only do we have health in our bodies, we have spiritual health as well, which is called salvation. And so when you know all of these things, you should begin to have more of an enthusiasm in the place of prayer. You see, because if you pray knowing that you are heard always, then you will engage in it more. The reason why many of us do not believe, uh, let, me, let me say this because sometimes it's, it's kind of like a conundrum because some of us, our prayers don't seem to be heard because we don't believe. But, the flip side of that is many of us do not pray because we don't believe. You see, unbelief is bad for business, however you swing it. You see, it keeps you from receiving when you pray and it also keeps you from praying as you should. But when we know the truth of the word of God, we will be more interested in engaging God in the place of prayer. However, what I was saying earlier on before feeling the need to make that clarification is that many of us struggle to believe in the potency of our prayer because there are results that we have yet to see. You know, the word of God says, Jesus speaking, as I quoted earlier on, Father, I thank you because I hear you, I mean, you hear me always. When his disciples came to him and said, teach us how to pray. They said, John the Baptist has taught his disciples to pray. He even taught them how to fast. And Jesus says, well, y'all don't have to worry about fasting just yet because I'm still with you. Because... Save your appetite for later because once I've been taken away from you, whether you like it or not, you will fast. That was what Jesus told them. He said to them, the friends of the bridegroom do not need to fast while the bridegroom is still with them. So for those people who think that the church is the bride, think again. Jesus says we are friends of the bridegroom. The new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. And the Bible says the Lord and his saints beheld as the new Jerusalem is coming out of heaven, the bride of the Son of God. And so we are friends of the bridegroom and we need to be able to understand what it means. But going back to the issue of prayer, I just thought I'd throw that in there for uh, people who may still be holding on to some um, uh, imbalanced theology. And those are the people online. Those of us here, praise God, we're standing on two legs. Praise God. Jesus was speaking to his disciples in response to their quest on the matters of prayer 
He says, in this manner shall you pray. Our Father who art in heaven. So, I've said two things. And those two things are these. If you pray to your Father in heaven, he will hear you. The reason why some of us don't feel heard is because we are not praying to our Father who is in heaven. We are praying to a genie that is in the bottle. And I'm going to explain that again very slowly because it is very important for us to understand that the only, the, the most guaranteed or the most effective sustainer of your prayer life is knowing that your prayer is meant only for your heavenly father. You see, if you come to God thinking God exists as an infinite source of power for your will to be done, you are praying amiss. We need to address this issue because a lot of the discouragement that is in the body of Christ today is as a result of religious practices that have come to dampen the passion of our souls. Religion is the greatest enemy of the body of Christ, of the believer. And the reason why I say that is religion has led us in so many ways astray and we now assess our relationship with God from the perspective of religious practices. And religion tells us that sometimes, you know, when we pray, God does not hear us because of our sins. Sometimes when we pray, God does not hear us because of this and because of that. And the, the truth of the matter is, the reason why God does not hear us is because he's only committed to hearing the prayers of the righteous. Only committed to receiving those people who come to him as a father. I can come to God. Asking him to bring all of his majesty and might to bear on situations of my will. If I am doing that, God is not a father to me in that perspective, but a mercenary or a contractor or a machine, also known as a genie. And when we go to God in that light and he doesn't respond, we begin to form ideas in our minds on who God is, which are not true because that is what you make him, not who he is. And when we begin to form these ideas, then these ideas become hindrances to us having a successful prayer life because whatever you do that does not produce result becomes a thing you don't want to do always. If I go to the gym twice a day for 30 days and instead of losing weight, I gain weight. I will cancel that subscription, ask for a refund, and then pray against the gym itself. <laughs> so that nobody else falls into that kind of temptation. I will pray for the gym to be shut down or for blindness to come upon people so they don't find the gym because it's like that place will waste your time, money, and sweat and still not improve your life. But the reason why people keep going is because I mean, the people who go genuinely as opposed to those who go to flirt and do other things. But the people who go genuinely because they want to lose weight only continue to go when they begin to see result. It is not a skill. It is human nature. It wasn't meant for you, Siri. You see, 
It is not a skill, but it is human nature. What is human nature? It is human nature for us to respond to results and to reward. So you're struggling in your prayer life and you're wondering why? It is because, let's be honest, you yourself tell yourself the truth. It's because you have not had as much result as you anticipated. And because of the lack of result, doubt has now crept in and everyone else but you is to blame. To begin to fix the problem with our prayer lives, we need to first of all go back to what Jesus said about prayer. He said your prayer, first of all, has to be to your heavenly father. And he says when you pray to your heavenly father, you have to recognize that his name is to be exalted. Okay? So many of us, we go to God, not as a genie. Some of us even try to go to him knowing that, okay, if he is my father, then he, he must care about me. So what has he got to say about what I am going through? But when you get to where your father is, you start to magnify the name of your problems over the name of your father. And many of us, we go to God and we hallow our own names. You can put up the Lord's Prayer. Oh, you already did. Wow, what a man of God. You see, we hallow our own names when we get to the presence of God. You go to God and rather than go to him as the provider, as the healer, as the restorer, you go to him and you keep complaining about how you are irresponsible, how you are are a failure, how you, you begin to magnify the names that you have adopted from situations, circumstances, devils, and even your own ignorance. And the Bible says, whosoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so I know that if I seek him and he is light that is unadulterated, then whatever darkness that may be about me would have to fizzle away. So there's no point announcing the darkness that have shrouded my thoughts and existence when I'm in his presence. What I do is I behold him and I become radiant. Your prayer life will receive healing once your heart receives understanding. The moment you know that this person is my heavenly father, and when I go to my heavenly father, if he is indeed my heavenly father, then I am not going to him to ask him to come and work for me. Because that would be disrespectful. I go to him and Jesus says, after you have hallowed his name, then what do you say? You let him know that you are committed to seeing his kingdom come. This is not about me and how I feel. This is about your kingdom. <laughs> you see, those three things alone will make you Irregular in the presence of God. Your prayer will become more fluid. You see, because I am not, you see, the things that we're afraid of, we're always reluctant to engage in. Let me say that again. If you're afraid of snakes, nobody can ask you to go hiking in the woods. And I'm not just talking to the black people. I'm talking to everybody. Because I've seen that stuff online now. It's like, oh, they say, oh, white people stuff when they see people going hiking and stuff. But I'm saying this because if we don't understand the concept behind the things that we're not interested in and the reason why we're not, we will not be able to overcome the limitation. And so the reason why many of us don't do certain things is because there is an underlying fear. Of that experience. <laughs> Let me tell you something. People don't just wake up one day and say they want to be afraid. People are genuinely afraid because of things that have happened historically. 
Because now we know that the human DNA registers and records things. And so if you're from a lineage of people who have suffered particular things, you will just find yourself subconsciously afraid of those things and you don't even know why. Several people are afraid of water, but they've never drowned. So you're like, okay, why are you afraid of water? Because there was a time that everyone on earth, apart from eight people, drowned. So there's a legitimacy to that fear. But the moment you have an understanding of how that environment or that situation applies to you, then you begin to lose that fear. Now, we're not afraid of drowning anymore simply because we know that the world is not about to be flooded out again because God made a promise. So now let us apply that to prayer. The children of Israel did not pray. Why? They didn't pray a lot. Sometimes they didn't even pray at all. And why? Because they were afraid of God. To them, God was not a father. He was not a friend. He was just this being that has so much power, can do whatever he wants. And we just find that a bit imposing and terrifying. And so they told God one day, they couldn't even tell him directly. They were so afraid of him. They said, Moses, well, since you and God appear to be friends, why don't you go and tell your big friend to stop coming here? Now someone is like, wow. What a missed opportunity. But every, I tell people, everything that those people did in the wilderness, every one of us would do today. It's just because your story hasn't been written, that's why you think you're better than those people. I always like to give this example. If you read Exodus and you read the behavior or read of the behavior of the children of Israel and you think they are very and you think of them to be a set of very uh, unbelieving people try this review the prayers that you have been saying in the last 12 months and how you have been saying those prayers you will you will discover very quickly unless you have already done that assignment and the Holy Spirit convicted you and you have made a change you will discover very quickly that you are not too different from them. They would complain instead of ask. Instead of saying, God, can you please give us some food? We're hungry. They would say, oh, God, you can't be a good God. Because if you are, why would you let me be hungry? And that is how some of us pray. We go to God complaining about other people, complaining about ourselves, complaining about things in the news. But have you asked for what you want rather than complain about what you don't want? They were guilty of that. You know one other thing that they were guilty of? One other thing that the children of Israel were guilty of was the fact that they cannot get themselves to pay attention to what God was doing as much as they were obsessed with what they were missing. The one who came from heaven, not just spiritually, he came and his Shekinah manifestation was physically seen. Even the Egyptians saw the pillar of fire. He came, the one who left his throne in heaven to keep a promise of 400 years. He must have a plan. There must be something on his mind. At least give him the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, you must be up to something. Can you tell us? No, they were obsessed with the garlic that they left behind in Egypt. You see, many of us are obsessed with the family members that don't talk to us anymore. Instead of you to find out exactly where God is freeing up your time. Because there are situations wherein some people had become idols in our lives. If you haven't spoken to them for two hours in the day, you feel like your day is not complete. Even when they're saying things that you know you shouldn't listen to, talking about other people, but you don't want to ruin the relationship, and you, start, you continue to compromise just because of a little fellowship, and then God causes for there to be 
a severance. And now you're obsessed with not having that instead of you to say, okay, God, I see, I see you move. You move in mountains. You make a way where there was no way. So you have moved this mountain. What do you want me to see? The children of Israel were so obsessed with not having Egypt anymore that they forgot to ask God or they failed to ask God about the promised land. And that was the reason why every step they took became a burden to them. Simply because as God moved them closer and closer to the promised land, they became even more puzzled about what God was doing. And all they needed to have done was ask. The children of Israel did not pray because they were afraid of God. God came down to meet with them. And the Bible says the mountains, the mountains started to skip like lambs. The heat and the fervor of his throne caused the mountains to melt, to flow as lava and form in another place. What many people don't understand is in fact, myself, I'm not taking credit for this as a scientist. It was revealed to me in a vision because I kept questing and questing. And one day the Holy Spirit was like, take him there, let him see. And I saw what it means for the mountains to skip like lambs. And what happened was the presence of God created so much heat that what else outside of his immediate perimeter became so cold that as soon as the magma went outside of the immediate perimeter of God's presence, they will immediately calcify again and become rock. And that is the reason why the mountains appear to have been skipping like lambs. They were melting and forming again. And that was God just wanting his children to know that it was not a fallen angel that was trying to deceive them, that it was him. And so he came in such a way that was unmistakable. But that which was the privilege now became a problem simply because instead of them to receive it by faith, they responded by fear. And so they said to God, stop coming here. Many of us say that to God on a daily basis. We keep telling God, stop chastising me. Stop correcting me. Stop making me stronger. Because every time I feel like I'm catching a little break, you just bring another one of your burdens here. Give us a break, God, will you? And that is what we do every time we complain about the chastening of the Lord. Every time you're faced with a challenge, you're supposed to receive it by faith and not respond by fear. You see, the things that come into your life come to make you strong only if you have faith. But if you have fear, you would say like the children of Israel, do you not care that we we'll perish? And guess who else said that? The disciples of Jesus. Why? Because their ancestors had that fear and it sustained for many generations. So why were they afraid of water? Because of their ancestors who did not know what God was doing. And so it is time for us to be able to receive the revelation of who God is and how he wants to be approached so that for once and forever, we can lose our fear of God's presence and lose our fear of lack of results and begin to engage God as a loving father who hears his children always. They said to Moses, tell God, don't come here again. We don't want this. This is too terrifying. Folks, the Lord is saying to us today to come to him as a father. Because when you come to him as a father, then you will not be afraid of him. I get it. Some of us, when we hear the word father, because our earthly fathers and some fathers that we know are not very loving people. They ruled rather than lead. They terrorized rather than embrace. And so because of that, I didn't know this until my wife started to explain that to me. My wife would say to me, 
She started saying that many years ago because she noticed that I was of this mind that God is good and that he's a good father. And I would, I would get puzzled when people don't see him like that. And my wife started to say to me that I think people who have had a difficult time with an earthly father translate all that impression and, and overlay it on their heavenly father God. And it doesn't even help very much when you read the Old Testament with a religious mindset and then you begin to see a God who is also like some of those earthly fathers who would not let you get away with anything. As soon as Adam and Eve ate the food, they were like, that's it, send them out. Right now, send them back in. I don't want them back in here. Put an angel there with a flaming sword. And, and so when you read with a religious mindset, and what is a religious mindset again? A religious mindset is that which closes the door to faith and opens the door to fear. Everything about religion is fear. Religion tells you that if you don't want to go to hell, go behave yourself. To avoid hell. But when you come to God as a loving father, then you're not going to live right because you're afraid of going to hell, but you're going to begin to live right because he has given you righteousness and you don't want it to waste. Can I say that again? You see, living right is not because I want to attain righteousness. The Bible says that righteousness is a gift. It was prophesied by Isaiah when the Lord said, leave my servants alone, their righteousness is from me. He says, we have become the righteousness of God. The Bible says we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. By grace have we been saved through faith, not of works, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. So I'm not trying to be righteous so that I don't get the judgment of God. I have been judged by God and found righteous in Christ Jesus. And so I live my life applying the privilege of righteousness that I have. Religion teaches us to be afraid. And so when you're dealing with God from a religious mindset and you read the Bible from the same mindset, guess what happens? You now find yourself in a situation wherein you cannot receive God as a father. But like I told you, even from that same example of God seemingly getting angry in Genesis and driving Adam and Eve out, if you look at it from the perspective of love, then you will see what he was doing. I'm going to say this for Al's sake because he was not here the first or the seventh time that I said it. You see, God asked for Adam and Eve to leave the garden because he loves them so much, he doesn't want to see them become like Lucifer. Lucifer and the third of the angels in heaven that fell were eternal beings. So when they fell, they fell forever because they were already in an eternal state when they came under an oath to rebel against the Almighty God. And now seeing man that he had just made that was yet to be eternal because as of that time, Adam and Eve had not eaten of the tree of life. <laughs> you see, they hadn't eaten of the tree of life, so there was hope for them. And God made it very clear. He didn't say, drive them out because I am angry. He didn't say, drive them out because they disappointed me. He says, drive them out and let there be a sword and an angel securing the entrance to the garden, lest they stretch their hands and take of the tree of life. And then it becomes over. Because after having sinned, if they had eaten of the tree of life, then they will be damned forever. And so God drove them out because of the fact that he knew that there was already a package in place to rescue them and give them an eternal life that they cannot ruin. So you see, two people reading the Bible, but getting two different gods out of it. One, a loving father, and the other one, a wicked master. 
One of the most famous ones that you can use when you're witnessing to people, if you haven't started using it already, is people say things like, what kind of God promotes genocide? The Old Testament is full of genocide, instituted by that one that is called the man of war. That would tell Joshua to go and annihilate an entire settlement of people. You know people say that. How many people have heard that? That which God promotes genocide. And whenever they ask me, I'm like, I don't know that kind of a God. And I don't want to know a God that promotes genocide. But if you're talking about Jehovah, if you're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he wasn't promoting genocide. He was exterminating the bad eggs. Because these same settlements of people, look at their names. And then you will understand their lineage. They are the offspring of the fallen angels. Whose seed is eternally corrupt because they themselves were corrupt men. And so God sees that as long as they remain. Have you not read in scripture wherein the Bible says that giants walked the earth before the flood and afterwards... So somehow they managed to return after the flood. And God knew that as long as they existed, they would not allow for there to remain a pure race of human beings. And without a pure race of human beings, the promise of salvation cannot be fulfilled because the promise of salvation that God made to Adam and Eve when he said to Eve and Adam that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of, a, of the serpent would not have come to pass because there would not have been a woman by the time Jesus was ready to come. The serpent was there when God said, because you know God lined them up, all three of them. The serpent, Adam and Eve. And he said to you, serpent, you will crawl upon your belly. You, Adam, you will eat in, in toil. And you, woman, you will give birth in toil. A lot of our translation says toil and sorrow, but they're the same word. It was just the translators that felt they would give one different to the man and one different to the woman. But the Lord said, while he lined all three of them up, that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. So the serpent was like, let's see if there will be a woman by the time this judgment is fulfilled. You see? Because Satan knew that as long as there is a woman, there will be a seed. And so every time Jesus is about to come to this realm, Satan tries to eliminate women. And that is the reason why the, one of the greatest attacks on this generation is on the woman. Now you ask people, what is a woman? They're like, oh, how do you even define a woman? How do you define a woman? And, and, and it's because... The second coming is imminent and it's one of the signs of the coming that Satan wants to minimize his own fear because he is so afraid of the seed of the woman. So if there's no woman, then there's no seed. What the devil is most afraid of is the womb because that's what makes a woman. So if someone asks you, how do you define a woman? A woman is a man with a womb. That's why it's called a womb man, shortened into a woman. Every other thing is almost the same. You have eyes like I've got eyes. You have nails. Even though I bite mine, I have them. If you see me in the morning, before I start biting them, I got nails. My hair may not, as be, may not be as long as, if my hair is longer than the hair of most people in here. So let's use another example. Yeah, shots fired. Oh, yeah. Let's not even go there because I know some secrets. I'm not going to tell you what secrets, but I will just say these things are not always as they appear. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, my wife is like, be careful. Are you coming home tonight? So it's not the devil that should be afraid of the woman, not just the devil. But I say this to you folks, if we must come to him, we must come to him knowing that he loves us. We must come to him 
knowing that he cares for us. We must come to him knowing that he is the father, and because he is the father, he has the final say. And because he's the father, he has a plan. Can we talk about God's plan for a minute? Right? You see, you see, the father has a plan for you. He says, my thought toward you are not of evil, but of good to give you a future and a hope. You can't trust a father that has no plan for you. Okay, the Lord says I needed to still say some things about the people whose earthly fathers did not reflect their heavenly father. And I'm sorry if you have had a bad experience with a biological or an adoptive father, but the Bible already warned us that the arm of flesh shall fail. And that is the reason why we should not judge God by man. In fact, if anything at all, if we have had a lousy, terrible, traumatic experience with man, we should allow ourselves to experience deeper gratitude for the faithfulness of God. You see, because where man has disappointed you the most is where you most have the opportunity to experience God enormously. Because every gap that is created by man is, is a gap that God wants to fill. He says, you must decrease that I may increase. And so where a man or woman has decreased in your life, whether by accident, whether deliberately, or just by impotence. Some people want to love you, but they just can't because they don't even love themselves. You see, some people wanted to be there for you, but they just couldn't simply because they were dealing with things that were higher than them. Let me say this, and some people may not agree, but I know y'all are people of faith. Man was made in the image and in the likeness of God. In your purest form, you are love. Because God is love. In your purest form, you want to love your children as your heavenly father loves you. And so if anyone is not living up to that, it's because there are impediments getting in the way of the light of the nature of God that keeps it from shining through. And so when you look at them, they may look irresponsible. They may look selfish. They may look self-centered. They may look like all of those things, but that is not who they are. That is who they have become because of sin, because of curses, because of satanic attacks. So we need to decide whether we believe that God truly made man in his image or not. Because if I believe that God made man in his image and in his likeness, then whatever is keeping this man from living up to God's image in my life must be the flesh. Must be sin. We're not making excuses, but we are rising above the limitations to see from God's perspective. We need to be able to peel back all of what the devil places on people, all of what life places on people, all of what biological mishaps place on people. We need to be able to peel those back and once again see Christ formed in others the hope of glory. Because when you begin to think like that, it will become easier for you to forgive them for they knew not what they were doing. Someone is like, oh, you see that father of mine? He knew what he was doing. He just liked other women too much. He was just too selfish. He just wouldn't spend his money on anybody else. He wouldn't make sacrifices for nobody. He knew what he was doing. That is from your perspective. But from Jesus' perspective, from the cross, they knew not what they were doing. You know when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they knew not what they were doing? He was talking about the people who nailed him to the cross. The ones who voted for him to be punished while Barabbas was released. And these people did not do it accidentally. They had a meeting upon meeting. They had meetings upon meetings. They consulted with their constitution. 
You know, when Jesus was sentenced, he was sentenced according to the constitution of the courts of the Jewish system. Or state, if you would. Because Caiaphas, the high priest, asked for the books to be brought. And what did he say? He says, according to our law, none should equate himself with God. So they knew, from my perspective, what they were doing. They had seen a man who was not their idea of a Messiah. But when Jesus was lifted up, he spoke from a different vantage point. And he says they do not know what they're doing. Let me tell you something. If you still think that you have been mistreated by family members or abandoned by parents because they are horrible people, then you don't even know who you are. Because if you know how precious you are, do you think anyone will see the destiny that is ahead of you? Do you think anyone will see you as God sees you and not embrace the opportunity to have been your father every single day? Let me say this again. If they knew what they were doing, would they have walked away from the abundant joy that you are? If they knew what they were doing, would they have missed the opportunity to partner with God to be a custodian in your life? I put it to you, therefore, even in the words of our Lord and Savior, that they did not know what they were doing. Anybody who knows what they're doing will not abandon a child that God has given to them because the Bible says children are the Lord's heritage. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. So why would somebody walk away from their reward to be chasing shadows? It is only because they do not know what they do. And so what do we do to people who don't know what they do? We ask for them to be forgiven. Because if we don't take care of that and make it nothing, it will haunt us to God's presence. And that is the reason why God says, if you know that someone has an ought against you, go and settle it first before you come here. Because while you're still harboring hurt, while you're still harboring trauma, if you come here, you won't really get the best of me because I am love. I'm none of those things. So you have the responsibility of allowing yourself full exposure to God. You see, Adam and Eve, the Bible says, they were naked before God and they were not ashamed. But many of us, we cannot come to God like that, simply because we are protecting ourselves from people. So you put on so many layers of protection against people. And so that's why even while God is trying to embrace you, you don't feel his love because you are too self-protected. We need to strip off all the layers. You know, the reason why we have those layers is because you're like, but when I was but a child and I was innocent, they took advantage of me and they broke my heart. If I love them again now, is that not presenting myself to be disappointed again? And God is saying, yes, it's a risk, but it is worth your while. Because without taking that risk, you cannot get all of what I bring. The Bible says he that loves his life will lose it. But the one who loves not his life will find it not just in this world, but in the one to come. God is saying he takes you being vulnerable to be able to embrace and enjoy my embrace. But then that same vulnerability can get you hurt. So stop putting on man-made heart protections. And the more you expose yourself to God without the fear of being disappointed by man, the more quickly you heal from man's disappointment. It's just a no-brainer because once you become accustomed to being with God, your heavenly father, he is also the healer. Once you come to him fully exposed, he will heal you.
But God doesn't go ahead healing people who cover their sins, who cover their wounds. He told the same thing to the Pharisees. He says, you come in here with your long garments covering your inadequacies. I haven't come for you. You will get no healing from me. And they did not get any healing because they came as, people, as though they were well. So I want to encourage you today. I believe there, is, there are people in here, maybe even watching online, who need to recognize that it is time to let go of any sentiments or mentality about who a father is that they may be bringing to God that keeps them away from the fullness of the love of God. You need to let go of that. It is a very difficult thing to do, so just ask God to help you. Because if he is pointing it out by his Holy Spirit and your heart is responding to it, and you're getting convicted, not condemned, but convicted to see that that's not right or that's been wrong in your life, then also let him complete what he has begun. God doesn't just go around letting his Holy Spirit convict his people of inadequacies and to just leave them feeling bad. No, he says, I have given my word to heal you. Let him love you. I'm going to read to you a verse of scripture. Actually, let's keep going. I tell you folks, God wants to see you more often. He wants you to pray more. He wants you to be able to receive more. Two of the three things that I started by saying was that many of us don't pray because there are times wherein we prayed and we did not receive. And the reason why you did not receive was because you prayed amiss. You were praying to a genie instead of to a father. I didn't fully explain that. What I mean by praying to a genie is always looking at God as someone you can use to grant your wishes rather than look for him to receive from him what his will is so that you can be a part of making that happen. But the religious mindset is what taught us that, is what taught us that. You see, when this thing called the prosperity gospel hit the body of Christ, it turned men and women into prostitutes who are always looking for the next available power with which to receive pleasure. It is unfortunate that some that scriptures and promises in the word of God that are supposed to energize and to equip us have been used to turn us to materialistic people who simply use God to fulfill our pleasures. And so everybody believes. And you know what people tell, what, what they tell us? It started with that prosperity gospel and then it became motivational speaking when they tell you, oh, you, you're the one. It's all about you. Believe whatever you want to become. That is exactly what you're going to become. I tell you that you will not find the basis for any of that in scripture. In fact, the scripture that is mostly used by motivational speakers is the one that says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So people are like, just believe whatever you want and then you can become that. And if it's not working, then you can ask God to help you to become what you chose. No. That scripture was not even talking to you. That scripture was talking to the wicked. The Bible says a stingy man, when he gives you food, is because he wants to get from you, not because he wants to give to you. That's why the Bible says when you receive food from a miserly man, be careful because as he thinks in his heart, so is he. But they just cut that scripture and they use it to make people gods unto themselves. I don't want to believe myself to be anything because that is the birth of ambition. I just want to know what he had in mind when he formed me. And whatever that is, let's run with it. Because once you have that clarity, then you will run faster than a chariot of horses simply because the wind of heaven is behind you. So going back to this concept, we're going to just touch it one more time and then we're going to move on. Folks, I believe that we need to let our hearts shift from God users to God pleasers. We've used God enough, at least we've tried to. Let us rethink everything that comes out of our mouths. Every thought and desire that we have because we are not praying to a servant, we are praying to a father. And every good father has a plan for their children. At least my heavenly father does. What is his plan? That is what I want to pray. And because I know that he has a plan, when I come to him, I am not afraid to trust him completely. 
I'm going to tell you four things very quickly from the book of Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 8, 8, and I'm going to tell you four things that I believe will help to energize and activate consistency in your prayer life. Look at verse 16 of Matthew chapter 8. The Bible says, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The people that Jesus healed were not asking for healing because they did not even know where they were anymore because they had been possessed by demons. But he knew what they needed. That it might be fulfilled, the plan that he already had. Your heavenly father knows what you need because he has written concerning you exactly what he has for you. Because you have an inheritance in Christ and that inheritance is already written. Even Jesus said it. He said, behold, I go as it's been written of me in the volume of the books. The Bible says Jesus healed them not because they begged. The Bible says Jesus healed them not because they had prayed and fasted, not because they were good people. He healed them because it was already promised that he would heal them. Come to your heavenly father always in the place of prayer with the enthusiasm and the curiosity to find out what he already plans for you. You know what that does to your heart? He allows for your heart to long for prayer. Prayer is a spiritual thing and that is the reason why it's very difficult for many of us to pray because our flesh is always at war with our spirit. So you need that leverage. And you know what that leverage is? Romans chapter 8 verse 15. The Bible says we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. To let you know that fear is a bondage. But we have received what? The spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Not by what it is a person. It is by whom. We cry, Abba, Father. Listen to that. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption. So because we have been adopted as children, he knows exactly what he has written concerning us, and he will make it happen. And that mentality causes for you to be more eager to pray because it allows for the spirit in you to overpower the flesh. Verse 22. The Bible says, then, but Jesus said to him, let's read verse 21. 21 says, then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. So this was somebody that Jesus was calling. Let me explain this to you the way the Holy Spirit revealed it to me. God is constantly calling us to come into fellowship with him. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door knocking, hoping that you will hear and open the door for me to come in so that we can do what? Fellowship. Jesus is not saying open the door so I can come in and tell you how to live your life. He says, I'm not coming to boss you around. I just want fellowship. I just want to come and sup with you. But he has to be let in by you. And so God is always asking for us to come. But many of us, like this disciple, Jesus was calling him to come. And he was like, hold off, Jesus, let me first of all bury my father. <laughs> I'm going to say this. And then we're going to continue the scripture. I just know that this verse of scripture also applies to those who may be struggling with an earthly or biological father that did not deliver. Don't bury them. You see, what does it mean to bury people? When someone is dead or when someone dies, what do we do? We have a wake before we bury them. You know the reason why we have a wake? Just in, the old, in, the, in time past, they had a wake because they buried some people and when they wanted to recycle their grave, their coffins, they noticed scratch marks. 
So then they recognized that maybe some people would bury them too quickly. They were not dead yet because if you're dead, you cannot be scratching your way out of the grave, right? And so that was the invention of wake keeping. When people keep wake, is they stand watching to see if that dead will get up. Did we know that that's the history of what it means to do a wake keeping? A wake keeping is not so that they can terrify you with a dead body. Or so that you can make sure that that enemy of yours is finally gone. That is not what a wake is for. The wake is for people who are keeping wake to ensure that they're keeping watch in case the dead wakes. Because once you bury them, it's over. And we do that all the time. People who are dead in sin, we then put more dirt on them. We bury them. We bury them in our hearts by calling them evil. We bury them by not forgiving them. We bury them by writing them off and blaming them and calling them all kinds of names. And Jesus is calling this person to come, but he's still saying, I want to go and bury my father. No, do not bury them. Give them life. Jesus said to the one who wanted to bury, he says, let the dead bury the dead. I've preached a sermon on this before. You can find it online titled, Let the Dead Bury the Dead. But I'm going to tell you this very quickly. If you have life, you are not to bury the dead. You're supposed to give them life. Because the Bible says what you have is what you give. So if there's a family member, a boss, a friend, or a spouse that is withholding love from you, you don't bury them. You give them life by loving them. For the Bible says do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's okay, I know this is not the most exciting sermon of all times. Whenever you tell people to forgive those people that they have concluded in their hearts, knew very well what they were doing. Oh, please don't tell me they don't know what they're doing. Don't tell me that. Then, no, but I'm just telling you what the word of God says. Take it or leave it. For they do not know what they do. So when they deny you love because of their deadness and you want to keep a grudge and hold them in unforgiveness, what you are doing is you yourself are denying yourself of the life of God. Only the dead buries the dead. The living are life givers. Give people opportunities. Give them love. Give them what you have received. Forgiveness. So when you are praying and you want your prayer life to be smooth, you must not be in the business of burying dead people. You must be in the business of giving life because Jesus says, why seek ye the living among the dead? Jesus is not going to be in the midst of your prayers when you are still behaving like the dead. I told you, I'm going to share with you four things. I've given you two. What's the first one? The first thing that I shared with you was what we read from verse 16 that says that these people did not know what they needed, but God already had a plan. When you come to God, know that he already has a plan. And always run to find out what else he has for you. And when you get there, you're like, man, all of these things may be falling apart around me. <laughs> but you are removing these things because of what you want to reveal. Open my eyes that I may see great and mighty things which I do not know. When you go to God with that kind of heart, you will pray in the morning, you will pray in the afternoon, and you will pray at night. Simply because when God reveals things to you, they are beautiful. You think you have prayed or you have a prayer life because you have need? People who pray because they have need realize that they can pray even more when they're not going just because they want God to answer their needs. If they're going because they want to see his face. Let me say that again very slowly. Many people that we know their prayer lives are prayer lives of always asking God for things. And if you think you're doing well, oh, I pray for an hour every day. And your prayer is just always asking God for things, trying to command the hand of God like a genie to grant your wishes. Turn your mentality around. Repent. That's what it means to repent, to have a change of psyche. When you change your mind and you begin to see that the purpose of prayer is for you to seek the face of God and see his face, 
Not only will you pray longer, you will pray more often. And not only will you pray more often, you will pray with more with more joy, and your prayer life will become a life-giving exercise as opposed to being a burden to brag about. We're going to look at the third and the fourth thing here from verse 32 and 33 of the same Matthew chapter, Matthew 8. Verse 32 says, and he said to them, go. (laughs) So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled and they went into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. This was what happened to the children of Israel. They experienced a manifestation of God's salvation, but it was not what they were expecting. So they demonized the process and said to God to never come to them again. What did Jesus do in this place? He delivered a man that was possessed with a legion of demons. And he also caused the demons, or we allowed the demons, to go into the swine. Why would he do that? Because the fact that these men were keeping swine meant that they were living in disobedience. So Jesus fell two birds with one stone. The demon-possessed man was being overpowered by satanic spirits. Go. Jesus set him free. The ones who were around him, his neighbors, were living in disobedience. They were candidates for demonic possession as well. And Jesus wanted to ensure that they were no longer living in disobedience by driving the swine away because he told them not to keep swine. And they were keeping swine. Remember this, they were still under the old covenant because Jesus had not died at that time. And so these men were not supposed to be keeping pigs. And that was what they were doing. And so because of the goodness of God, they labeled God a bad person. Your prayer life is going to take off the moment you are able to forgive not only men, But the moment you go from releasing men from the things that they have done and releasing yourself for having misunderstood God. I'm going to say that again. You see, these people misunderstood what Jesus did. And that was why they said to Jesus, leave our town and don't come back. They drove Jesus out of their town. Simply because of what they did. Do you know that many of us will do the same thing with our actions? You, you, you fail to understand what God was doing when he allowed that girl to break up with you. And that is the reason why you don't pray anymore. Because you prayed for her to come back and she didn't come back. Some of us, we lose loved ones and we pray for God to not let them go while they were on their sick beds. And they still Pass away, and instead of asking God what he is up to, we conclude that he must be a bad God because he didn't do your will. And so when things like this happen, we take it personal. They took it personal because the swine was their friend. They were the ones keeping those pigs for crying out loud. They were waiting to make some hot dogs. And Jesus drove away that which was pleasure to them. And now that became Jesus' problem. Let me tell you something. We need to receive healing in our prayer lives because many of us do not pray as we ought to simply because we're still holding God in contempt because he didn't answer some prayers we said while we were still ignorant. Like I told you, the third and the fourth thing are contained as secrets in these two verses of Scripture. Thing number one is you need to believe that God is for you and not against you. He has a plan and that is the reason, that is what he is committed to. Thing number two, it is not your place to continue to withhold love and withhold forgiveness 
Because you are not the dead that buries the dead. You are one that's been raised to life so you can be a life giver. Thing number three is this is how God operates. God was the one that drove the pigs away. He's the one that worked in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure and you need to believe in his process. And you must also believe that that same Jesus that drove away demonic people, that drove away demons from people, that set them free according to his will, has a plan for everybody. And that plan is to bring you to an expected end. If you would embrace him as a good God, as a loving father, it would change your prayer life. We're going to read one more scripture as we break bread. And I skipped verse 17 of Matthew chapter 8, but we're just going to read that and, and then we're going to break bread. If, if um, I think, okay, Cody's already helping us with the communion, praise God. The Bible says in verse 17 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, that he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Folks, what is prayer? First of all, I want you to do something real quick. Just as a demonstration of your willingness, if you are so inclined, to see a transformation in your prayer life. I want you to say to the Holy Spirit, I need your help. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Thank you, Cody. The Bible says, for likewise, the Spirit helps us in all our infirmities. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. As part of his commitment to you is that he himself took all of your infirmities. Your lack of understanding, our lack of understanding of how we should engage our Heavenly Father, Jesus took that. And he modeled to us what it means to be heard always and to always be in fellowship with the Father. And he modeled that by praying, not my will, but yours be done. Now let me explain Romans 8.26 and the combination of Matthew 8.17 and Romans 8.26 is what we're going to break bread with. In fact, let me do you a favor. Let me read to you Romans 8, 17, because it's interesting, it just occurred to me that these two 17s are actually very connected. And so for you, it's easier to remember one 8, 17, and then you apply it in two instances. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Look at what it says. I read to you verse 15. I alluded to verse 16. Let's read verse 16. It says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says that we are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. We are indeed. And what that means indeed means that we actually did obtain something. It was not just talking. He gave us something. And what did he give us? He gave us salvation by taking away our infirmities. Now, this is what I want you to take with you. He did that by the Spirit. The Bible says, likewise, the Spirit. So, here is the shocker. God is not the father of your flesh. Mm -hmm. 
So when Jesus says, in this manner you shall pray, our Father which art in heaven, Jesus was saying, never pray in the flesh. Only pray in the spirit. Because God is the God of all flesh, but he is only father to spirits. Does your spirit get hurt? No, it is your flesh that, get, that gets hurt. Because the Bible says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Your spirit is not at, a le at the level wherein gossip bothers you. The Bible says that a tail bearer is like one who fires tasty trifles. So when someone talks bad about you, it hurts you, but not your spirit. Because your spirit is not at that level, it is your emotions. When an earthly father abused you, mistreated you, and abandoned you, he didn't abandon your spirit because he was not the father of your spirit. He was only the father of your flesh. The father of your spirit is your heavenly father who is always faithful. So, when the Bible says the Spirit helps us in our infirmities, God made a commitment to take all your infirmities upon himself, but for you to enjoy that privilege, you have to be in the Spirit because you can only call God, God, you can only call God Father when you are in the Spirit. The Bible says, and we have given this power to the sons of men that they may be called children of God if they believe. So it is your spirit that is able to approach God as a heavenly father. The summary of it all is that your prayer life will take off when you stop praying in the flesh. Your flesh is what fills the, the negative figure in your bank account. It is your flesh that makes you cry to God. Do you not care that we perish? These bills are overpowering us. No, no bill can overpower your spirit because your spirit is seated in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father. It is your flesh. And when you cry to God out of fear, guess what? He's not listening because Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Only sons can please the Father. Jesus said, the Father said concerning Jesus, this is my beloved son. Do you know why he said that? I've explained it to some of you all before. But let me explain it again and then we're going to land this plane. Jesus was told by John the Beloved, I mean John the Baptist, that he didn't need to get baptized. Because according to the flesh, Jesus was already born of a virgin conception. So there was no sin to wash away. And so John was like... <laughs> Are you being serious now? You don't need for me to baptize you. Because what I'm doing is I'm baptizing people in water unto repentance. Mr. Saint, what are you repenting from? So in the natural, Jesus did not require to be baptized by John. John says, I am unworthy. And that was the same John that Jesus said, up until he was, I mean, he was the greatest man to have lived up until that time. He says, of all men born of women, no greater has there been than John the Baptist. He said, but I say to you, the least in the kingdom will be greater than he. And so John knew exactly what he was saying. And Jesus was like, ah, naturally speaking, I don't have to be baptized. He says, but go on with it anyway, that I, that we may what? Fulfill all righteousness. How did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. What is the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy. So the moment Jesus elected righteousness, he checked the kingdom box and the heavens opened and the Bible says God spoke and said, now that's my son. Because as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons. 
So if you want to pray to a heavenly father, you need to be led by the spirit, not by your emotions. So stop going to God screaming and asking God to supernaturally provide for you because you're about to die of hunger. Those prayers are not of faith, they're of fear. Go to him and hallow his name. And say, I come here today because I know you are the father of light with whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. I come to you knowing fully well that none of your words fall to the ground unless they are fulfilled. And no word that you speak return to you void until it has been performed. I come to you because your name is Jaira, the one that provides. I come to you because you are Rapha, the Lord that heals. I come to you because you are the one who swore by himself, the ancient one who swore even by his name to not let me down. I come to you because I know your name is great. And when you come to him like that, your bills and your worries will say to you, uh, we'll see you later. Because we cannot stand here. He's helped you in all your infirmities, but that help and that privilege is enjoyable only when you are in the spirit because your flesh is not an heir of salvation. It is your spirit that is an heir of salvation with Christ Jesus. This flesh is dust and the Bible says to dust shall it return. But you see that spirit that is in you, especially, I mean not especially, if you are born again. Okay, it's not just anybody at random. You have to believe there's a condition. For as many as have received him, even to them that believe on his name, John chapter 1 verse 12, have we given the power to be called the sons of God? Born again believers, pray as a spirit, not as flesh. I'm going to address two critical things that the Lord's been showing to me as I've been looking at heads in this place today. I see somebody holding a picture, an old picture in black and white of a child who is holding their hands. You're a child and another child is holding your hand. And the Lord said to me, that other child is the father. Many of us are holding old images of our earthly fathers and all of their childish behaviors. And you kept that image alive in your hand, and you're approaching the Almighty God. And God is saying, that is not my will for you. It is not my will for you to remain in that place. And so it is a childish behavior to abandon one's responsibility. It is a childish, childish behavior to always want to play with toys rather than grow up to learn how to use tools for effectiveness. But that was where the man was, but you don't have to be there. So the Lord wants to deliver you today from such infirmity that continues to plague your flesh. Your carnal understanding is not allowing you to progress into spiritual privilege of an heir. The second one is actually a lady that is wearing, a man that is wearing a dress, a pink dress, like a little girl, but about a teenage girl. But I know it's a man. And the Lord said to me, that is another kind of father who failed to be a man. You see, these are two images describing the same dilemma. And whenever God gives you two dreams or two pictures for the same problem, like when Pharaoh saw the cows and he saw the sheaves, the Lord is letting you know that he's bringing you salvation and deliverance. From today on, by the grace of God, any false image of what a father is that plagues your heart, that keeps you from being able to rest and trust in your heavenly father, they will be deleted from your memory. I pray that those pictures will be thrown into the fire and that you will be set free to receive a clean, clear picture of the truth in understanding of what it means to be loved by your heavenly father. We can pray as a religious exercise, but that is not what God is asking for. God is asking for prayers that are said from children in love to a heavenly father who loves. Congratulations to you. 
if your father was a loving father, if he was caring, if he held you dear to his heart, if he spoke well about you all the time, if he walked long hours to make sure that you can attend that next party and that you can graduate from that school, God bless you, but I tell you, even you need to elevate your expectation because the best of men at their very best are still men. Your God is the better father. Let us break bread. In fact, I promise you that we're going to just break bread from those scriptures, but um, my heart is excited for another scripture. And we're going to read that one. Come with me to Genesis chapter 13, verse 6. Genesis 13, verse 6. He cares for you. He knows what you have need of even before you ask he doesn't want you coming with hurt and pain in the flesh. He wants you to approach him in the spirit and then you will receive healing for the body. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 13, now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Genesis 13, 6, the Bible says that the land could no longer support them. I read this to you today because as I was standing in here, I started to feel the burden in the hearts of some people. Some people literally shut down the moment they started talking about fathers and about coming to God as a father, as a loving father. But let me tell you this, the land was not able to what? Support them. Why? Because their possessions were great. This might have been the story of Abraham and Lot, but it is the story of your spirit and your flesh. Your flesh has a lot of possessions, and your spirit does too. The Bible says God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Your spirit man is loaded with resources, with joy, with righteousness, with peace. But the land or the ground of promise that you stand on is unable to support you because your flesh is also carrying a great possession of hurt, of guilt, of sorrow. And one of them has to go. You need to let go of Lot. You need to let go of everything that you're holding on to, ambitions that were not birthed by God. Many of us are depressed and sad because certain targets that we set for ourselves are not fulfilled. But have you asked yourself, did that target come from God? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up. There are too many things that your flesh is holding on to. These possessions are allowing the ground of promise to shake from underneath your feet. Let go of pain. Let go of disappointments. Let go of sorrow. It is your emotions that are holding on to these things. Let go. And then you will begin to see your spirit flourish in the land. The difference, how do I know? Oh, I'll, I'll, if you need proof that Lot was the flesh and Abraham is the spirit, is look at how they lived their lives. Lot always operated by what he can see. Abraham operated by faith. Abraham was called a friend of God. But what was Lot called? A rebel. He rebelled even against the plan of God for salvation. They had to drag him out of Sodom and Gomorrah. The way you drag your, your flesh into fast the way you drag yourself to go to that person's house to go and apologize, even though it was their fault. How many people have ever had to drag their flesh to places? I used to, I used to have to drag my flesh to my wife to go and apologize. I told you the story one day when my wife, you know, she, she got into, anyway, let's not even go there. But Okay, someone says, let's go there. Yeah, my, my, my wife... We got, my wife a, we got my wife a new car and she hit someone's mailbox and she didn't even tell me. I was like, hey, wait, 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 wait. This car wasn't like this when we picked it up. She was like, 
Oh, I might, I might have hit someone's mailbox. Might have. What happens if you told somebody? You know? You see what I mean? What, what happens if you said something about it? You know, because at the end of the day, I know you don't care for these things. I'm still the one who's going to try to figure it out or get it, you know, fixed. You understand what I mean? And I was, I was angry. I was beyond mad. I was hitting and running into everything that I could find. Until the Holy Spirit was like, uh-huh. So what has this done for you? And then I realized that the Bible says that whoever sows into the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Because only a good tree can bear good fruits. And we know that the flesh is enmity against God. So whatever you do out of the flesh does not produce anything. And so he said to me, dude, you better turn around and go and apologize. And he was even getting close to dinner time, which I had an incentive. So I dragged my flesh. My flesh was like, no, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I dragged my flesh. And I did that up until it got to a time where when it comes to things like that, I don't even have to drag my flesh anymore because I had put it to death. Anyway, we're going to break bread, but I want you to let your heart release, Lord, so that the ground of promise can sustain you. Let me say this, Sister Natalie. You know, the ground of promise, the reason why you need to be on the ground of promise is because the words that God has spoken, they need to come to a place for activation. And the word of God, the Bible says in Isaiah, that every word that God speaks is like rain that falls to the ground. It doesn't return to the Lord until two conditions have happened. Until it has first of all touched the ground, watered the ground, and then it can go back to heaven. And so when the word of God comes into your life, it has to hit the ground of promise. Which means God has said so many things, but which part of, you, of it have you come to realize? So that part that you have realized you need to drive Lot away from it so that it can sustain you and produce for you. All right, I'm going to stop here for now. Let's break bread. Father, in Jesus' name. Ha. Ah. Okay, since we have already taken time, let's just take one more. Because this one, this one I believe is going to tie the knot, is going to tie whatever loose ends for some people. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15. You see, I literally saw it written as I was about to open this communion. I saw it in front of me. Holy Ghost, Father, thank you for the prophetic. I saw it in front of me. Holy Ghost, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15. It says the elder and honorable, he is the head. Hey, let me, t let me say this. <laughs> I see, now I know why I had to see that scripture. I was about to open the cup and I saw Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15. And this is why the Lord had to reveal it because the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, there are things you have said today that they already know, but they have not been able to walk on or walk in. Because it takes power. The Bible says you cannot just be a son of God. Tia, who is the son of God? The one that is led by the spirit. Who is the son of God? The one who pleases God. Your spirit that does not sin. That is the son of God. But let me tell you something. You cannot just wake up one day and say, now I'm ready to be a son of God. The Bible says power has to be given to you. For as many as have received him, even to them that believe, have we given the power to be called the sons of God. And the Lord is saying to me that they know that they need to be sons. They need to be in the spirit and not in the flesh. But they have struggled because they have not received the power. Here is the power. The Bible says the elder is honorable. The elder and the honorable, he is the head. Between your flesh and your spirit, who is the elder? Between Lot and Abraham, who was honorable? Your spirit has been honored by God to be called a son of God. 
justified in Christ Jesus, glorified before the throne of God. Your spirit should be the head and not your flesh. Let your flesh stop telling your spirit which direction your life should go. Give honor to whom honor is due and do not wrest power from him that the Father has glorified. Your spirit, let him be the head. You may eat of the Lord's body. Father, we thank you for we receive this bread, this piece of pastry here today. We receive it as your body, Jesus. Not because we're religious people and not because we exalt any sacrament above your name, but because we know you said to us that as often as we have the opportunity to do what you did, you took the bread and said it is your body. You took the wine and you said it is your blood. So we also take the bread today and we say it is your body. We take the wine, we say it is your blood. We do this in remembrance of you. We call your name to remembrance in every situation of our lives. Your name, the provider, will make every need bow. Your name, the healer, will make every infirmity go away completely and never to return. We do this in remembrance we, of you. We call your name and the essence of your love for us, the essence of the joy of our salvation, the joy of our salvation. We call it to remembrance today in the honor of you who is the head of the church. You may eat and drink in Jesus' name. My heart is moved with compassion because it is time we break the shackles of powerlessness. I'm going to pray for one person real quick because um, I feel your pain. Stephanie, you come. You see, because the Bible says that by the laying on of hands, the gifts are stirred up. You see, in the week, the Lord showed me a group of people who honor the gift that God's made me to the body of Christ as a prophetic teacher, as a prophet and a teacher. And what I saw was not what I expected, but... I was like, oh, this is how it works. Now, you know what the Lord said to me? <laughs> he says, you are honorable. He says, when they come and they listen to you, that is my mercy and favor at work in your life. Some come to listen to you say certain things that they already know, but I still let them sit and listen that I may show honor to the gift. I said, thank you, Jesus. And incidentally, you are one of those people who honor the gift of God by listening to and even commending others to do the same. Let me tell you something. Today, you have the reward of the prophet. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that every Opposition that has been resistant to power in your life will bow before the compassion of the Son of Man. For as Jesus was moved with compassion, he healed them and delivered them from the spirits and forces that troubled them. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. In the name of the Father, of the Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, and in the name of the holy wind of God, this day I declare you free. Go and see the glory of God. In the name of Jesus. In my soul, that my God is there. He is here. And the machine is a little bit Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God bless you.
Let us celebrate the Lord and what he's done on tonight. Hallelujah. Gavin, if you help us with the offering slide. Thank you, sir. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. While the given details are being put on the screen. Oh, praise the Lord. Just before that. Ah, hallelujah. I am um, going to try as much as possible to, to switch gears. But I want to pray for Nicole and Ron. My brother Ron and my sister Nicole. I want to pray for you. Yeah, you can come up here, please, if you can. You see, you know people who are in the spirit. That color blue is the color for the day. Don't worry, if you get home, you can still wear something blue and take a selfie. Look at Tia, she's got blue glasses on. Uh, 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 look at Sheila, she's trying to be humble. She's wearing blue too, and she's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not drawing attention. But uh, I say that, but I really want to say congratulations to y'all, because today is your wedding anniversary. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Because it is not just a wedding anniversary. It is an anniversary of the hand of God being made manifest in the lives of families and generations because this was what was um, once called an impossibility. The Lord made it possible. You understand what I mean? You see, because where men have continued to fail, creating gap after gap, the Lord came in and he filled your cup, and now it's overflowing. You see, because this is a union that is nothing short of a miracle. You see, from inception to conception, it is the end of the Lord. And so I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that your joy will know no bounds. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that your obedience will know no hesitation. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will conceive and deliver all of what God has already in mind for you. In the name of Jesus, thou art an example of a believer. Not just two unbelievers, but two believers. You see, the Bible says you are an example to believers. And to be an example to believers means that amongst those who are already seeing the impossible made possible, your light will stand out. Others will see that which the Lord is doing in your life, give glory to God, and begin to receive divine activations for replication. To be able to see miracles that you enjoy replicated in the lives of others. Because his commandment to you is that you will be fruitful and that you will multiply. I feel a very strong sense. It's not a sense. It is an unction to pray. God bless you. Michelle, you come. God bless you. Let's celebrate these folks, everybody. God is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Michelle, come. And Natalie, come. I want to pray for both of you. You see, the Lord has strategically positioned both of you to speak the language of results. I want you to be on this side and I want Natalie to be on this other side. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let me explain to you very quickly. God has positioned you in the lives of others who know no other language but result. They don't believe result, results. They don't believe in just hearing what others have to say because of where they have been. And so they have to see things. And for them to see things, they have to see those things in you. And so I pray for you today that as the Lord has lifted you as banners, you are emblems where you're at. You are flags pointing to the kingdom. And I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that your flag will not be one that hangs down, but it will fly. You will fly under the wind of result and response. When you call upon the Lord, they will answer you for their sake. While you are yet speaking, your heavenly father will move. And the naysayers will become yea-sayers. In the mighty name of Jesus, because of your example. 
You see, your businesses will flourish not because God wants you to, he doesn't want your heart to be drawn away by wealth, but he wants others to recognize that when God says a thing to his daughters, he does it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Go and let your heart be at peace. Any agitation of the enemy is only a confirmation that your heavenly father is already on the move. Because the Bible says when God arises, his enemies scatter. And so when the enemies scatter, they may look like they're coming after you, but they're running away from your God who is coming through for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. God is good. Hallelujah. I pray for you all that you will hear the voice of God because I see you looking through some documents and you're looking for signatures. And the Lord says, you will see my signature. You will hear the voice of God. God bless you, Alan. Hallelujah. All righty. Come on, let's celebrate again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have the giving details on the screen. We're just going to give in faith tonight to our family online. Uh, several ways to give. PayPal at Chameleon House. Um, our cash app, dollar sign Chameleon House, as well as the Zelle number there, if you prefer that way. We also have the envelopes. If you need one, just come see me, or it's right here to my right, your left at the end of the row here. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for this time where you have met yet again with us, O oh God, where you have seen about us and have granted unto us deliverance deep down, O oh God, where you have reminded us, O oh God, of your love for us, of your patience, of your mercy, how freely available it is unto us. And so, Lord, we give in faith, we give in honor, we give in obedience tonight to this ministry, O oh God, sowing seed for freely, O oh God, we have received and freely we give. We declare that as we sow these seeds, indeed, they shall be blessed and you shall bring the increase. We declare that all glory and honor, power might belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Hallelujah. God is good. Ain't you glad you came tonight? God is so good. Everyone have a blessed night.